Okay, thank you. So welcome again, everybody. And um, welcome back to school, I guess, for a lot, a lot of people. It was this week, some of you last week. And I, we're excited to hear how everything is going during this transition. I know a lot of SAUs have been reaching out with questions to both Jen and I, and that has been wonderful. We are answering them as fast as we can, the best that we can as well. So please keep asking. Don't feel like you are bothering us at all. So we have um, sent out the agenda and Jen, do you wanna quickly put that in the chat as well? Sure. We are going to open today with um, a little presentation from our consultant, 619 consultant, Susie Perry. And she is, um, we've been working hard um, on mul multiple different levels within the, the state regarding how to develop and support a mixed delivery system. And I know that a lot of you have heard us talk about this in our meetings. And so Susie has um, graciously come up with a presentation to help start a deeper understanding of this. And we know that there will be questions as we work through this because it is all new to our cohort one school districts that are engaging in this transition process. So I will turn this over to Susie at this time. Thanks, Sandy. And uh, yes, like she said, we've been talking um, across departments with fiscal and with data and programming and compliance. And, you know, it's really trying to find a way to share with you um, the big picture and then get into a more granular level. So today we're going to present um, not only some kind of overview information about a mixed delivery system, but also some scenarios that we've uh, selected for you for today that should help to um, illustrate what we mean by that mixed delivery system. So I think um, uh, Jennifer is going to share her screen so that I can look at uh, my notes. And so if you will go to play the presentation, we're looking at the um, the slide, you know, the, the view where you see all of the notes and all of that, if we could um, just put in the presenter. I think one more. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Here we go. All right. So, um, this is um, about service delivery scenarios in early childhood special education. And like I said, we are talking about the services that are being provided, the settings that children are in and will be in. We'll be talking a little bit about enrollment and some fiscal or funding considerations. So if we can go to the next slide. For the past 25 years about, CDS has been providing the majority of early childhood special education services to eligible children in the state. Um, however, new legislation requires that school districts by 2028 become involved in the provision of these services. They will become responsible for ensuring that children with disabilities are located, identified, and if determined eligible, served in the least restrictive environment. And that is you, cohort one. Uh, next slide. The first cohort of school districts will be start, starting this school year, conduct child find activities and serve its preschool age children in their boundaries. As school districts assume the responsibilities, services to the identified children may be provided in a variety of locations. Head Start, public pre-K, approved child care centers are all options that the district might consider in consultation with families based on the needs of the child. During this transition, CDS will continue to be an organization that serves a large part of the state for the delivery of the special education. Uh, and uh, so I guess, yeah, that's, I have to kind of keep track of both the notes and the uh, what's happening on the slide. Um, to 
special education to children and families whose children are eligible across the state. Uh, next slide. Over the next several years, school districts will assume more and more of the responsibilities for identifying and serving preschool age children. The services that CDS provides are still integral to the overall service delivery model. The programs and services they provide are indispensable. The staff are highly trained and knowledgeable. Their programs and services are widely distributed and they support children who need early intervention and early childhood special education. So while some things will change, others are still very necessary. Uh, next slide. One possible model for representing the ways that CDS will continue to support children with disabilities is shown in this diagram. As described earlier, children are, may already be attending a childcare setting when they were identified as eligible for special education. The goal is to enable the child to remain in the program that they have been uh, attending prior to having a disability. And the US Department of Education has made this a priority. As the IEP teams in school districts identify preschool children and their needs, the locations for providing needed services will include a discussion of the child's least restrictive environment. Starting with the general education setting, such as a preschool program in a Head Start, a public pre-K, or a childcare center, teams will determine what services, accommodations, and modifications would be necessary for the child to access the general education program in their current setting. Uh, if you could uh, click it one more time. If the district needs support and resources to enable the child to attend that program, CDS may be contracted to provide a wide variety of services. And while the school district is ultimately responsible for ensuring that the child receive a FAPE, it may be able to utilize the supports and services of CDS. See how that's looking. Yep, great, thank you. Uh, next slide. Our goal is multi-pronged. Ensure that children get the services that they need in high quality settings established in the state. We know that a variety of settings are appropriate for preschool aged children and that access to an inclusive high quality program is correlated to better outcomes. You will hear us use the term regular early childhood program, which means that the majority of the children in the classroom do not have a disability. This is the least restrictive setting in that the child has the most access to typical peers, curriculum, and locations. To help districts make good placement decisions, since they have the responsibility to make the offer of a free appropriate public education or a FAPE, we have imagined a number of use case scenarios that take into account what children need, what districts have, what families want, and what states are required to offer. The current ways in which Maine offers options to preschool children look very similar to what you're seeing on the slide. Lots of different um, configurations and opportunities based on where uh, the child and the family live. Next slide. Having to make individualized decisions about each child and provide what they need seems like it could be challenging and complex, but research shows that most children with appropriate supports and services can participate in and benefit from attending regular early childhood programs with typically developing peers, especially as three, four, and five-year-old children. What you're seeing on this slide is the continuum of placement options that school districts must make available should the child need it. The continuum is organized from left to right from the uh, least restrictive to the most restrictive settings that a child might need. Each movement to the right reduces access to typical children. Access to typical children, as I said, is highly correlated with better outcomes. It turns out that kids learn a lot from other kids. If you'll uh, click the, the slide. Um, beneath each placement option is the related data code that is used to indicate the environment in which the child will receive their special education supports and services. These data codes are submitted to the state as children are enrolled. 
the data are used to track indicator six, which is called early childhood environments or preschool environments, and is then submitted to the US Department of Education. We'll go to the next slide. We are required to offer a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. So let's break that down and illustrate what a FAPE means. The free, the F in FAPE is free, that special education provided at public expense under public supervision at no cost to the parent. Appropriate means special education that meets the standards of the state education agency and for preschool designed to participate in appropriate activities, that it confers meaningful educational benefit and is in the least restrictive environment. For the public side of this, special education in an appropriate preschool, elementary school, or secondary school in the state. And the education part of that is that special education that is provided in conformity with an IEP or an individualized education program. Um, on the left is um, a, a nice little handout that we'll be sending with um, the PowerPoint presentation from today that describes the various environments that I showed on the previous slide and includes the codes that are, are used. And I think that um, it, we are going to be, you know, I, I, there's a mechanism for how the codes will get to the state, and we'll be talking about that at, at a later time. So next slide. So based on the FAPE mandate, the IEP team develops a plan that will support the child to make educational progress in the general education curriculum, what we know as early learning activities. You'll click the slide. Children with disabilities who need specially designed instruction are entitled to services and supports. But from a practical standpoint, most preschool students with IEPs will attend a regular preschool classroom for the same amount of time as their non-disabled peers. Students with disabilities are expected to receive a preschool education commensurate with what their local preschool public school system makes available to their non-disabled peers. And we know that as public pre-K. So if you'll click uh, again. The uh, state-funded public preschool programs are outlined in Chapter 124 to offer for four-year-old children uh, 10 hours per week for 35 weeks. That's for anybody who is offering a public pre-K program. And um, some school districts have those and some do not, I understand. Um, Three-year-old children are only mentioned in the main unified special education regulations known as MUSER. And although the department will work to include three-year-old children identified in special education into the rule, that has not occurred at this time. The FAPE offer for three-year-old children is six hours per week per user, and IEP teams need to consider the needs of the child when determining the special education services for this age range, and actually every age range. The team may consider providing additional special education services based on the individualized needs of the child. So if you'll click that, um, the program for a child with a disability is individualized and based on the child's needs. So they may need just a service or they may need more than a service or a program in which to implement that service. And that's part of the FAPE offer. So if we can click that one more time. there. Um, there may be families who, uh, so that could take place in a childcare setting, a pre-K setting, a Head Start setting, so that, that uh, the program could take place in any number of environments. And these are the state and federally funded opportunities to access a FAPE. And if you could click that one more time, there may be families who need additional coverage, time beyond what is publicly offered access to additional time beyond what the IEP team identifies as necessary will be the responsibility of the parent. Ultimately, the IEP team is responsible for delineating what the child needs and how the district proposes to fulfill those needs. And that's incorporated into the IEP. You'll go to the next slide. As districts meet with families and children are evaluated as part of child find 
you get to know the family's circumstances and needs. Each district considers what the supportive opportunities are within their boundaries. And we know that some children may not yet be attending any preschool program, if you can click that, or may be attending a program within their boundaries. And then we can click it one more time. But the IDEA says that districts in which the family lives is responsible for providing a free appropriate public education. This means that the home district considers providing services to the child in the program that they would attend if they did not have a disability. The district provides the necessary services to which the child is entitled and putting them on a wait list or other delays in the provision of services, for example, due to lack of staff or lack of funding cannot be a reason to delay or deny services. One more click on that. Ultimately, partnerships between programs, families, and teachers are necessary to meet the needs of our youngest learners. And we may have to come up with some creative ways to make that happen. Let's take a look at some of the scenarios to help illustrate district and family conversations leading to appropriate services. Districts will want to discuss the following aspects as they make decisions about the program that the child will attend and talk to each other about where the child is currently, what the family wants and needs, what kinds of programs are available in the district and in the community, and what the child's needs are and the eligibility based on the IEP. So what services, what programs, what hours that child would need in order to make progress. And then they would have a conversation about what is that child's least restrictive environment. And we are asking that we pay attention to the LRE codes. We'll be providing some professional development on that. And um, ultimately the IEP team has to make a decision. And what is the, the decision of the IEP team is what we're gonna be looking at today in these scenarios. And based on that IEP team decision, what are the district's next steps? What is the funding? What arranging for services must they uh, undertake? And what uh, are the enrollment activities? So let's look at our first scenario. And um, these follow those same bullets that we just finished talking through. And we have developed, I don't know, seven or eight different scenarios, and we're picking out two that, to illustrate for you today and um, should be able to provide some additional ones uh, on subsequent meetings. So in this scenario, the child is currently a three-year-old child who attends a child care program for about 30 to 40 hours per week. The family wants full-day child care because the parent works. And the needs on the IEP are listed as one hour per week of special education services. So maybe some um, behavior supports or some therapy, uh, some occupational or physical or, or uh, speech language therapy. The IEP team says that a child needs a program to have access to a FAPE. So even though there's one hour of services, in order to be able to deliver the specially designed instruction and to have the child have an opportunity to make progress on that. They're, they're, in this case, the team has decided that the child may need a program. So one hour of SDI during the program that operates six or more hours per week. And that aligns with chapter 101 um, with the six hours per week. Um, the placement that has been determined based on that is that the child um, is eligible and the LRE that is recommended is a regular early childhood program. So that means the majority of the kids in the classroom do not have a disability. The LRE code for that is REC 10, uh, uh, services to Y or with services. And a re it means a regular early childhood program more than 10 hours per week with services in the classroom. So the, what the district then talks about, well, what do we have available within our community or in our district? And we had, in this particular case, the district has CDS approved programs that are half and full day. 
They have Head Start. They have in-district pre-K programs um, that go for six hours per week. And they also have extended days for a full day per week. They have um, a local child care program that is a two-star program that meets five days per week, 40 hours per week. So thinking about all of that, the IEP team makes a decision. And the decision that they made in this case is that the child will be offered the district pre-K program with the extended day option. The district will be responsible for six hours per week. So when we say responsible, that they are making sure that, that the parent does not have to pay for any of that, where five hours of that six hours is general education and one hour of that is special education. The parent will pay for the remaining childcare time. And the district agrees to transport the child on district provided transportation. So the next steps for the district are to enroll the child in the district pre-K program and the extended day, make sure that they're getting the extended day. The pre-K registration should indicate the portion that the parent will cover. So that needs to be kind of delineated and that the services that the child needs will be initiated upon the first day of attendance. And so that's kind of how we uh, looked at all of these different components and thought it might be best to illustrate um, how you know, the decision-making and the considerations and the discussions that uh, districts would have with, with families. Are there, I would like to take a second to make sure that there aren't any um, questions or thoughts, although I do believe we will have time. We only have one more scenario um, to talk about. So please let us know if there are questions that are kind of percolating and um, we can get to those. So for scenario four um, out of the seven or eight that we have, the child in this case is five years old they're in a child care program outside of the district boundaries. So it's, it looks like the parent takes them with them. Um, and the child attends that program three days a week, three hours per day, uh, for a total of nine hours per week. And the family wants him to have interaction with peers in a preschool program, and, but says that he also can't tolerate that for more than a few times per week. The parent wants the child to remain in the program that he has been successful in for the first time and is near the parent's work and the sibling also attends in that program. So um, then the IEP team says that the hours of special education that this child has on his IEP are three hours per week of special education. So SDI, specially designed instruction and related services. And the IEP team says that the child needs a program to access FAPE like just those three hours of service would not be enough for him to make progress. So the placement that has been determined is that the child is eligible and a regular early childhood program, less than 10 hours per week with services in some other location was decided. And um, so that was what they initially thought was appropriate for this child. Um, the district looks at what all they have. In the district, we have pre-K program that's 10 hours per week. We have local child care programs for, that are two stars. And we have a Head Start program in our boundaries. So the IEP team decides to offer the in-district pre-K program. So remember the child was attending a program outside of the boundaries, right? But the district decides to offer the pre-K program. The parent rejects this offer and requests delivery of three hours per day of the specially designed instruction at the child's current location. The, ITP team, the IEP team reaches consensus to allow the child to remain in the current program and services will be delivered in the program. The district will contract with CDS to provide the services, the IEP reviews, the COAST assessment, and the administrative costs. The district will pay for the three hours of SDI and the remaining six hours of childcare to have access to the program as part of the FAPE obligation. The parent will continue to transport the child to childcare. So the next steps for the district in this case is that they would contract with, with CDS to provide the services. They would um, 
create an MOU or a contract with the child care to provide the preschool programming so that it would allow their teacher to enter and, and participate in that child care program to deliver the specially designed instruction. They would enroll the child in the district of residence, so the district in uh, which the child is living, and the district would be responsible for the child and oversee the administration of the FAPE. So while CDS is providing the services, they still have to maintain that responsibility to make sure that this is appropriate for the child and it continues to be appropriate and monitors uh, the child's progress. So those are two very different examples that we hope illustrate some of the different ways that this could roll out. Um, we do have a number of references and resources. These are all clickable links. This presentation was based on information from the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center from, um, rep with references also to um, another, many of their other TA documents. We include in here the bill that was passed, chapter one, links to the chapter 124 that talks about what's required. And then um, the Q&A on serving children with disabilities that came out this past November from OSEP that talks about um, keeping the child in the program that they would attend as being what the, um, the government would like to see is, is their policy. And I think that's the last, there may be one connect and I'm, we have contact information and then there was one more contact information on there uh, yeah, to share. So if, I don't know, I do see Lou has his hand raised and Scott. Hi, Susie. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm imagining as a former special ed director and a CDS director, I'm imagining the controversy of, of your last scenario where the parent rejects your public pre-K placement. I know in the past, um, Eric Herlin has certainly, uh, our, our lawyer go-to guy has always kind of said, well, you, you have to offer the FAPE and if the parent rejects it, then you have to make a decision. And I think most of us in public special ed were used to saying we're offering an appropriate program. Why would we decide to pay for childcare out of district? It doesn't make any sense to most of us who worked it. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't want people to have the impression that it's mandatory that you come to consensus to send a child in their existing placement, irregardless of the fact that the department would like us to, or the yes. Fed. So it's it's a hairy scenario, I think. It is, and you know that's why we brought it forward is that we wanted to illustrate that there are some decisions that the IEP team is going to have to make, and um, really considering the child and family and district, you know, the potential to be able to serve this child and, and you know, in a way that benefits everybody. So that's why we brought in this idea of CDS being able to deliver those services to illustrate that that's an option that, that districts have to contract with and that they are available and will continue to be available to help support the delivery of special ed services. The other idea was that we didn't want to disrupt the child care system that we have, that there are many uh, children per, and there are many, it is part of what a local community is offering. And if we, if school districts start pulling children out of child care programs, that's not going to be healthy for the community either. So I think that, that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I, I, I can just see where that might uh, be an, um, a curious case. The other, yeah. the other thing, when I left CDS, more than half of the, actually well more than half of the um, children were receiving speech only, and a lot of them are tick therapy only. And back then, that was just six years ago before I came back, back then we weren't um, required to provide a public pre-K for, because they were getting one hour a week of, of articulation therapy. How does that speech only, which is a majority of CDS cases still, how does that play into FAPE and settings? I think, um, Sandy, I think we've had some of these discussions before. Would you like to uh, take, take a stab at that one? Yep. So 
Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Susie, but it is an IEP team decision. If the child can be served through services only, that is a location option. And nationally, that rep should represent about 3% of your, sped, your special education population. So I think we have um, many more children who are receiving their special education in that manner. And my understanding is that there had been a, a kind of an um, over application of the medical model into right. the preschool age children where we weren't really considering in the way that we should the, the, um, the need for children to have access to the educational side of a FAPE. So um, access to a appropriate preschool activities is more than um, just a therapy. And as we know, in order for children to learn, they need opportunities to practice and to practice in a setting where that they could get that feedback um, from their peers and from the adults who are um, aware of that child development and um, to gain, to apply the learning in the child's natural settings. Great answer, thanks. I see Scott has a hand up. Yeah, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't think anybody's going to right now, but I, I wanna know what the rule is around when a child is placed in a childcare setting out of state. When you say placed, who Parent, placed parental, parental placement out of state. Oh, so the school district, you want me to, Megan, you wanted to do that one? Well, I think that what I wanna, the, what what we kind of ran into last week um, was that we have these different scenarios and depending on different nuances of the scenario could get you very different answers. And so what we had a little bit of a brainstorm about at the end of the week last week was basically creating a form um, to share with with you. And so when you have them, the situations come up, it's, for instance, the question is going to be, it's how old is the child? Three or four years old. Is the child parentally placed because of a concern related to IEP services? Is it a special purpose program? All of those kinds of questions you would fill out sort of describing or populating the, the sort of scenario for us. So we are dealing with the most pressing scenarios with nice. the greatest detail. And then what we can do is we can have our policy and program people look at, okay, here's what is in keeping with state and federal law and rule. And then we get to then pull in our friends at finance and our friends in data to say, what what would this be? So, you know, I, I'm gonna say all of that. And then Susie, certainly you can chime in to say like, well, here's here's some of the questions we would ask about an out of district or an out of state placement. Mm -hmm. Because the depending on the program and depending on the reason for the parental placement, it could get some different answers in terms of what we do. And it's mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a, a wonky process to go through because there's in preschool, there's no such thing as parentally placed private preschool. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, share the document on that with you that OSEP created that helps to explain why. And because um, preschool is not publicly funded, it's not a, a grade. So um, when, and so only kid, the only kids who are entitled to a special education are preschool age children with disabilities. Yeah. So there's no such mm -hmm. thing as a, as a we, we get some confusions around that um, parentally placed kind of when we're thinking really what we're meaning by that is the child, the parent wants to at attend the child care over here. And then the district has to make the offer of FAPE and like we've been kind of trying to illustrate today, negotiate and say, well, how can we meet the needs of the child as that are based on our analysis and our evaluation and, and the goals and the services that the child needs? How can we offer that appropriate public education and make that offer to that child? When we're not saying that, you know, you shouldn't, we are saying that we have to consider lots of options the out of state one, you know, is something that we probably I, I would have to look into what your state law is around um, attending outside of the state and what the obligations are. So, 
No, it's not only that. One of the challenges that we discovered during COVID when, when we were remote, when kids were staying with, you know, a non-custodial parent in Massachusetts visiting and this and that, there's licensure issues for our related service providers to provide that service across state lines. Mm -hmm. So that's a real concern of mine um, is how do you do that? Uh, how often right. is that happening for you? Like how many kids are we talking about that are it's in happened this? To one, uh, two so far. Okay. Well, and parents are fine. Um, but it's just, you know, what do you do? Uh, as a well, formal, I, I can't send a, I can't send a main licensed speech path over to Newington. Uh, we always fall back on the district being responsible for offering a faith. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you are covered when you are doing that. Yeah. I understand that, but my challenge here is how is the district going to procure services that are licensed in another state? I, I, it's not for today. It's just to yeah. think of <laughs> So, thank you. But, but Scott, in the example that you're giving, uh, this is a, a child who is placed in a preschool setting or is it a child, child care? care. Child care. Child care. Okay. I think one of the things that uh, any superintendent would jump on first is the residency issue. Yep. Whether or not that residency is uh, in your district or not, and how to make that determination. And then there's a host, like, um, like Susie says, there's a lot of law about parentally placed private placements. And I know that that may not uh, be applicable for three to five, but still, it's the district's offer of FAPE that has to occur. The district has to offer FAPE, and then you can go back and forth if the parent rejects it and make your decision. But you have to offer an appropriate program to mm -hmm. the child, no matter what. That's step one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, you know, like when we, we could dig into more of that parentally placed document with district personnel who are experiencing or confronted with this kind of more. So I think that might be a, a way to maybe just put us put together some time for us to go through that and and to kind of provide the professional development and technical assistance that you need so that you can understand what those trajectories are and those decision points that you have to make. Mm -hmm. That's an OSEP letter, Susie. Yes. I'd love to see it too, if you could forward yep, it. I can get that. We can include that in the handouts from today, for today. Great. Thank you, Susie. Um, if there aren't any other further questions on Susie's presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer for a quick poll. Um, I'm going to put a poll out there and it's regarding transportation. So if you guys, if you all could answer that for us, it would be wonderful. Um, I just placed it in there. So it's um, how many of you are providing all preschool students transportation to their SAU? And I'll turn it back to Sandy. Thank you for taking that poll. That will give us some more information on how we can better provide you technical assistance regarding transportation. So one of the questions that came up last week was about all of the different requirements that may happen in the mixed delivery system. One of them is that all of those settings in the mixed delivery system do require that staff entering them have a DHHS background check. And that is different from the CHCR fingerprinting check. And as one of our um, directors was sharing, it you have to sign up. It's at Identigo. Um, it is free for staff. And um, once it's done, you'll get, I think, a letter in the mail that will um, share that You've been cleared and that you can go into child cares, head starts, and family child care programs to provide services. So if your staff do not have that already, I would encourage you to make that um, help them make that appointment for that. Um, 
another question that came up was regarding vaccination requirements for staff, um, um, specifically when going into Head Start program. And we know that Head Start programming is a federal Head Start program. And we have um, our early learning team that is here today that would be able to give us some more guidance on that vaccination requirement. You want me to jump in, Sandy? Sure, if you would like to, we'd love it. You are our local expert on Head Start, Stacy. If you, if everyone here does not know Stacy McCoy, she is on the early learning team, and she is our, as I've said, our Head Start expert. So yeah, I'll I'll go a little bit further, um, because I because I don't want to have too much rope and to hang myself. But I am the Head Start Collaboration Office Director, and I am on the early learning team um, at the DOE, and. I have a really unique position. Um, I get to work obviously with the wonderful folks on the DOE side of the house, but also I'm required to do a lot of collaboration on the DHHS side of the house, as well as regionally and nationally. There's essentially one of us in every state and we are responsible for supporting collaboration um, uh, at the state level and also supporting here in Maine, I support um, 11 local grantees. So I did do a little bit of research. I have to be careful because I am not considered an OHS program specialist, um, federal guidance expert, or I'm not a TNTA person. But what I can tell you is I um, have great access to those people. So as questions come up, it's my responsibility to go and get um, the correct interpretation of the Head Start performance standards. So in regard to this staff health and wellness business, um, what I discovered is that there is no expectation um, for contractors that are coming in to provide their health uh, immunization records, so to speak. They're very specific requirements for, for staff. Um, but there, but the additional guidance is that, um, and I worked with a couple of other partners in other states to see what they were doing. As there's this expectation that we're just ensuring that anybody that comes into a Head Start program does not pose any significant health or safety risk. So, I reached out to my other collab directors on a call, and in many of the states that are a little bit further down the road than us, a lot of times what those states will do is get an attestation from the partner agency, the SAU LEA, um, just that the partner is up to date on whatever the health requirements are for the local school. Um, and that would essentially meet, meet the intent. Um, my understanding, though, right now, too, is, you know, I think some of this is going to be uh, an, uh, some need to maybe work with our grantees as well, too, to make sure they're clear on this. So it's one of those things that I've elevated to our TNTA folks as well, too, just to make sure, because we do have some new directors and some new program folks. So just want to make sure that everybody's clear so folks are consistent about, as you guys are building these partnerships, what they're asking for, because I understand there was some confusion and thought that there needed to be, um, you know, that that would be an, a requirement, but that is not a requirement. Um, however, um, getting some sort of an attestation um, would, would be fantastic. I'm gonna say this as somebody who's fairly new to my role and who went down a rabbit hole, I could not find on the DOE site, are there specific requirements, what are the health requirements? I'm just curious to know on the DOE side of the house um, for employees, because I, looked and looked and looked and I, I have not been able to find anything. So maybe somebody could educate me as I kind of do this little crosswalk. That is a great question, Stacy. I do not have that answer. So, um, and I, Megan isn't coming offline to say, I, I know that answer. So I don't know if we have that. Nope, but, but that is a, again, we hang on to the questions and we get the information and we get back to people. So that, I think that would be just really helpful to know. And the other thing that I've been doing is my predecessor had started a really wonderful crosswalk um, between all of the 
different background check requirements. And um, there have been some updates, like I know Office of Child Care did some revision um, just in uh, January of uh, this past year, well, of 24, this year's almost done, I guess. So, um, but I think that this will also be really helpful in some of the other work we're doing, but to support what's happening here, just to make sure, especially as we get out in front of other cohorts, um, you know, we're learning so much here, but making sure that folks um, in the next cohorts understand what those requirements are and we can be more supportive of getting out ahead of making sure they're getting um, those background checks done in a timely manner because it does take time and just and again supporting our grantees as well too so everybody is clear and the other thing I'm just going to put in a really quick plug is all of the Head Start programs that you'll be collaborating with have essentially disabilities managers I know some of you have already been in partnerships but they're an excellent resource um, as you kind of build out these partnerships and are so um, incredibly plugged into the needs of the children that they're already serving based on the very intense um, requirements of Head Starts and how to meet those needs, especially some of those children have been in the program um, since early, some since, you know, not long after birth. So just um, if there's any way that I can help facilitate um, those additional collaborations and, and connections, please let me know. I can drop my email in the, um, in the chat. Great. Thank you, Stacy, for that update. And as we know, Head Start also serves three-year-olds, so they're a great resource for supporting, potentially supporting students with IEPs that are three as well. All right, so um, the next agenda item, um, a question came up regarding the frequency of assessing a child using the day C or the Battelle. And this is kind of two pronged. So, and I'm not quite sure in which, um, which avenue this question was asked because the day C or the Battelle can be used to evaluate children and use that for the identification process for a developmental delay. If you were on this Zoom early, you heard that um, Lou Collins is putting together some um, a presentation, some technical assistance on developmental delay because we've had that request from uh, cohort one SAUs because it's new to them um, to become more adept at um, assessing children and walking through that process in the IEP meeting. So that's one of the ways that you would use the DC or the Battelle is for that identification process or re-identification process. I'm assuming this question was being um, asked in the through the lens of the COAST process, which is that um, process that Susie went over, was it last time? We did the presentation on the COAST process and um, that's the child outcome summary. And you do that when students enter into part B and when they exit from part B. And the, those scores are federally reported. So one thing is, is that we know that we need to do some more training on the coast. The last training was kind of just that overview training to get you, um, a general understanding of the term and what that process looks like. We're also dovetailing this with technical assistance and I'll share that in a minute regarding training on the BDI and the DC. But we know that because um, there are many different ways to assess the child outcome measurements, that we need to do more technical assistance because not every school district is going to do it the same way. I think one of the great things that when you do partner with some of your community members, um, like Head Start, they use um, TS Gold, I believe. And I can't see Stacy, but she'll correct me if I'm wrong. And that is a um, assessment that can be, that is used for the child outcome measurements. So we're adding, um, tools to your basket so that you can use them to assess children um, for the child outcome summary as well. So if I did not answer that clearly, 
or there's further questions on the, the use of the Daisy and Battelle, please let me know now so I can answer them. Yeah, it, actually, you, did it, you pretty much nailed it, the, the answer. Um, okay. It was my question, but now it's generated another question, right? <laughs> so <laughs> um, can we use that original um, assessment as the baseline when they enter Part B? Yes, for the child so outcome to, measurement. Right, so we wouldn't have to re-administer that when they actually start school. Okay, that's the question, all right? Thank yes, you. and it may be one of the evaluations if the child is already in Part C that the team talks about. Yeah, yeah. Looking at using or ruling out um, or talking about what disability category they need to evaluate, they may be using that anyway, and you would have that information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lori, I see that you put something in the chat. Let me just pull that. Yes, so that that's kind of, uh, Lori put in there that both of those assessments can be used for identification of preschoolers under developmental delay, which is one of the areas that we're gonna, we are going to provide more technical assistance on as well as, as the COAST process, so yes. Um, so Sue Terrell, you've asked a question about the Battelle as a screener. I am not the expert on the BDI or the Battelle, so I'm gonna look to my CDS directors. I believe Battelle has a screener, but that's not the assessment that you would be using. That's a different assessment, correct? I'm seeing heads nodding. Okay, so there, Battelle does have a screener, but you would not use that for the COAST process or developmental delay. I mean, I think they can be information and then whether or not the information gathered can help determine whether or not the child meets eligibility um, is, is one thing. And then whether or not that information that's in there can help inform the selection of the COAST scores in the three outcome areas is, is another. So, and I don't know if anybody has had experience, you know, or what, what the experience has been doing that with respect to the COAST process. Susie, are you asking about using the screener? This, yeah, I don't, I'm just wondering if anybody has tried that because, you know, what, what you need to make a decision about the COAST process is the degree to which the child is demonstrating age expected behavior. And then you assign a number to it in each outcome area. And so if you're going to be doing it like by hand or very organically, that's one way. There's another to do it with um, published assessments and the published assessments have a crosswalk that will help you to align the items with each of the, out the items of the assessment with each of the outcome areas. And so, you know, there's a couple different ways to go about this. It just depends on what, what you know, I don't know what that screener has to offer. I and I, I, would, I looked up a crosswalk. I don't think I saw a crosswalk for that. So, Lori? Um, so we, I'm, I know Battelle does have a screener. We did not use that screener. I'm not aware of any site that used it. Certainly, we stopped doing developmental screenings as CDS about four, four years ago because it was significantly impacting our ability to meet our timelines. Um, and so we, we now have meetings within 15 days of the referral and, and then order the evals. So certainly I know in public schools, there are pre-K screenings or doing kindergarten screenings that I feel like is a really best practice process if you can do that quickly. And it does then inform, can inform the cost process. It can inform what evaluations are necessary much more than just a parent interview does, which is what we are doing at this point. Sue, if we did not answer your question, just let us know. We may have made, made made you have more questions. 
No, Sandy, that's fine. I could have sworn last week somebody said something about at the beginning of the program using the Battel as a screener and then at the end of the year using the Battel screener again to measure outcomes of the program. And that's kind of what blew my mind because we use TS Gold mm -hmm. in our preschool and that's what we were told to use last year from Pre-K for Me and all of our training. So then we're like, well, wait a minute. Now we've got this other and why are we, you know, over-evaluating these kids with 14 different measures? So if you're telling us we don't have to use it, thank you. We will no. use TS Gold as we have been and we'll also have the data from the original Battelle for the kids with special ed. Yes. So yes, we're not asking you to over assess or screen children. And if you are using the TS Gold, that's going to give you that information that you need for the coast. And I know that you and I have already talked in, um, you're also planning on um, learning more about the Daisy and Battelle. ASAP. I've got three kids referred yep. since we started school. So my evaluation timeline is tick, tick, tick. Okay, so here we go. The next thing on the agenda is we're gonna talk about, um, we have scheduled the trainings and this went out in, I'm assuming Jen, it went out in the agenda this morning. Okay, and we're gonna make sure that it, you're gonna have this information in the email as well. So we have a trainer and um, it is recommended that you do have the BDI test kit and the DC test kit. If you haven't ordered those, order those. Once again, we are reimbursing SAUs right now for purchasing those. And if you haven't connected with Jennifer Hopkins on getting reimbursed, please do that. So we are offering two different types of sessions. We're doing a remote via Zoom training and we're doing an in-person training. It will be in Augusta location to be determined where work Jen is working on getting a room, unless you already have one, Jen. No, okay, she's shaking her head, no. So we have two dates for the BDI for remote. It will be September 17th from nine to one and September 24th from nine to one. That's the remote sessions in person. It'll be September 19th from nine to one and September 26th from nine to one. And once again, we will, um, be, you'll be getting this in, in our informational email. And then the DAC training, um, once again, please order the kit so you have it for the training and the remote session for that will be October 1st from nine to one. If additional time is needed, depending on the number of people attending and how fast she can get through it, she has tentatively um, put on the schedule um, October 8th from nine to noon if they if you need that additional time. And in person, it will be October 3rd from nine to one with um, October 10th if needed. And um, once again, this can be administered by anyone who has a 282 or um, experience with evaluations or an evaluation class. And so you'll wanna make sure that you are, um, we will probably, Jen, have a registration process for this that we will roll out, yep. Um, and you'll wanna register your you yourself or your staff that will be attending that. Um, and yes, I know that you're not bad because <laughs> you're, your Zoom still says that, but I know that he's not there. And yes, I know that that was the message previously before we got permission to use some of our funds to pay for this. So that message has changed. So thank you for asking that. Um, if you have already purchased the BDI and the DAC, please forward the um, invoices to Jennifer and she will help take care of that. Teresa. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to change your name on Zoom, right? Okay. And that is all that we have on the agenda. Are there any questions that we can help you with? It is exactly four o'clock. I can't believe we used the whole hour.
Sandy, can I just get, I hate to be the one that asked the question at the end of class. I hate, I did not like those people. Just a quick question. I actually put it in an email. When we were talking about the DHH background check and we talked about Head Start, does that apply to Head Start and child care settings or just Head Start? That's the question. I will, I will look to my early learning team, but yeah, or my directors, but yes, it is, applies to any of the, your mixed okay. delivery system. All right. Anyone out there, child cares, family child cares, head starts, All preschool right. programs. All right. Thank you. Yes. Nicole's giving me the thumbs up. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I am so excited to hear about how the first month goes. And um, please reach out if you have any questions. We'd love to also at some point get some pictures of your shiny new classrooms and all of their materials with kiddos in them. Um, we're, we're very, Lori Whittemore is smiling in the corner on my screen and I know she's very proud of all the work that she did this summer getting those ready for you, so. And we're grateful for all of you who are so willing to you know, become the first group um, to venture into this. And so appreciate you coming to these meetings and and uh, we are working real hard to make sure to answer your questions. And Leanne, I saw that you threw in the um, chat a question about mixed delivery systems. If you would, do you have a specific question or is it just the term? Just the term, I, I haven't heard that before probably you've used it and I didn't pick up on it. Nope, and it it is it is new to everyone engaging in this work. It is what Susie was just sharing with everyone about how we are using our community partners out in the field in your community. So that would be your family child cares, your preschools, your head starts, your other YMCA programs to help provide preschool programming so that FAPE can be applied for students. And we're, the term out there is mixed delivery system because it's a, it's a basket of different things that may be going on in your community to support children and families. Okay, I was five minutes late, so I think I might've missed that <laughs> intro. No, nope. good question, because there might be others out there that are like, okay, I don't dare ask what that means. Kate, um, Sandy, Kate, Kate Stinson had an, um, a question about speech therapists administering the evaluations. Yeah, I don't see why not. I don't see. Yeah, why it's they fine. Would, In yeah. part C, actually, they have, um, you know, different, um, different therapists administering the BDI and the DC. So mostly it's the BDI, but certainly anybody who, who is uh, qualified to provide assessments would be able to use that tool. Yeah. So one of the questions and I don't wanna keep this meeting going on so much longer. I know everybody's probably had a really long week already and it's only Wednesday um, because that's what four day weeks are like. But one of the questions that has come up is what can I use for developmental delay to evaluate? And it that's why we're supporting the technical assistance around these evaluation is because they cover the five domains that need to be reviewed to look at that disability category. So some best practices around that are more than one evaluator, yeah. more than one setting. And, um, but the requirement is that it can't just be based on one assessment. So that's when you would also dovetail it with a classroom observation or any other observation that was recommended. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. You too.